Um, so welcome to our Impact Insights webinar series. Uh, we're very pleased to have everyone join us today. Before we get started, I'd like to welcome Dean Dale Smith, who will be providing us with our welcome today. Dean Smith. Thank, thank you, Nola. And thank you for joining the College of Business Administration at LMU for our new series, Impact Insights. As our business landscape goes through a series of major changes as a result of COVID, we're dedicated to bringing you valuable insights with impact and doing our part to create a stronger Los Angeles and extending our impact regionally, nationally, and globally. This series is aligned with our mission for advancing knowledge and developing business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the global community. We've had a great kickoff week to date last week, and today we're welcoming two of our faculty and one of our business partners to look at the marketing world post COVID. And as the summer continues, we'll hear from our faculty, industry partners, and alumni thought leaders. The topics are varied, the views are diverse. So again, thank you for joining us as we engage together, sharing the knowledge, the skills, and abilities that will lead to a successful rebirth in a recovering community. Though intimate dialogue and a commitment to build bridges among us, we're striving to live our mission here at CBA and in the spirit of our Jesuit roots to be men and women for and with others. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our Senior Director for Business Development Strategy, Nola Wanta, who will share the way our next hour will unfold. Nola? Thanks, Dale. So for our presentation today, before we get started, I just wanted to provide some webinar and community guidelines. So first, um, all of your, oh, I'm sorry, all of your, um, uh, your screen should be on Zoom, um, on Zoom should be on speaker view. Also, please use the question, the Q&A box to type in your questions, which we will address uh, at the end of the presentations. We will also leave time for an interactive session, um, interactive Q&A at the end of um, our, our structured Q&A session. So please raise your hand and we will allow you to speak. And as a friendly reminder, this uh, webinar is being recorded and we will share with you the recording and the presentation afterwards. So without further ado, I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers, Professors Andrew Rome and Matt Steffel, and one of our instructors as well, Eric Johnson, who will talk about marketing challenges and opportunities post-COVID post world. So now Andy and Matt, Eric, please take it away. Thank you, Nola. Thank you, Dale. Uh, good morning, everyone. Our webinar today looks at the marketing challenges and opportunities brought on by COVID-19 and other recent events, such as the national protests addressing social and racial injustice. Uh, again, my name is Andy Rome. I'm excited to join my two colleagues, Eric Johnson, one of our M School founding members and adjunct professor here at LMU, and also founder of the Ignited Advertising Agency and the El Camp co-working space in El Segundo. I'm also joined by my colleague, Professor Matt Steffel. Matt and I co-direct our M School program, and Matt is super active in marketing and brand strategy consulting. Um, so uh, today, we, feel, we believe it's more important than ever for companies small and large to have a set of tools and tactics for navigating the choppy waters that we face today. So for this webinar this morning, we planned three mini talks followed by a Q&A discussion session. Leading off this morning is Matt Steffel, and Matt will talk about the need to find balance across the short term and long-term long needs and opportunities today. All right, thanks Andy, Dean Smith, Nola. Um, so yeah, so the title of my talk is Finding Balance, uh, Planning for Tomorrow While Listening to the Needs of Today. Next slide, please. Uh, this isn't news to anybody, but COVID-19 was like a uh, punch in the gut for many businesses, most, uh, but not all. Um, it has affected nearly every aspect from demand to consumption, production, our supply chains, um, how we invest, how consumers spend. And for many businesses right now, it feels like a game of pickup sticks. Like all the sticks have been laid on the table and which ones do we pick up and how and, and being extra careful in doing so. 
Next slide, please. There's a, uh, a term that was developed in uh, the Army called VUCA, which stands for Volatility, Uncertainty, Complexity, and Ambiguity. And uh, as we celebrate the six month anniversary of this pandemic, we are living in a state of global VUCA. And I mention this because as we can see in this image here, uh, with the constant news feed and vaccine updates and political and social unrest, um, we've, we, it's thrust us into uh, short termism and some myopia, right? And so we've lost sight of the forest for the trees. Next slide, please. And it's re-brought up this decade-old um, battle between performance marketing efforts and brand marketing efforts. And in one corner, we've got performance, um, which is really all about today. And it's lower funnel activities, which are really about creating immediate demand and transactional value. And some examples of that would be paid search, for example, or offering consumers discounts. So discounting your brand in order to move demand up. Um, what's, lo what's lovely about these is that they're very measurable. They're typically very digital um, and they generate sales today if, if applied properly. And in the other corner, we have brand, which is really all about tomorrow. And it's these upper funnel activities around awareness and consideration and information an example might be an informational video or paid, uh, paid social advertising to generate awareness. The challenge with this stuff is that it tends to be much more ambiguous when it comes to measurement and uh, in tracking ROI. Um, and the ultimate goal is really building equity. And so when we're in this state of VUCA, next slide please, that our investment of both time and money tends to be more performance oriented. As certainty returns, um, and by the way, also as, as revenue increases for corporations and firms and businesses small and large, the shift tends to shift, I'm sorry, the focus tends to shift more towards brand. Um, which is not necessarily recommended. As a matter of fact, next slide, please. Most brand builders, particularly in the media space, recommend a 60-40 split. 60% 60 of your time and attention should be spent thinking of and generating equity for the future, ensuring future value, while also stimulating demand today. 40-60 um, split, um, and this should remain consistent over time. Next slide. Um, Sharma et al. did a um, meta-analysis. And a meta-analysis is basically they looked at all of the studies um, during VUCA times, which would include pandemics, um, recessions, things like that. And what they found was is that brands that maintained or increased their presence, share a voice. Share a voice is just a, is a advertising term for how loud you are in the marketing landscape. So share a voice, which is built through awareness and then consideration, upper funnel tactics, while exploiting short-term demand, lead, for example, lead generation, emerged out of the down economy stronger. And this is really some empirical evidence as to why that 60-40 split really makes sense. Additionally, uh, McKinsey published a study in 2017. Granted, I know this is uh, publicly traded companies, larger companies, uh, but they analyzed 615 U.S. companies from 2001 to 2015, which included all sorts of VUCA events during that time. And they found that uh, businesses that McKinsey characterized as long-term oriented outperformed their peers in earnings, revenue growth, and market cap. Next slide, please. So with that said, I'd like to share with you three practical strategies for success in a VUCA environment. It's really the, the title of this mini talk, which is about finding that balance. Uh, first tip, know who you are and where you're going. Second tip, listen. And I'll give you a couple of uh, tools on how to listen more. And then finally, acting authentically. Next slide. I'm not a big... Um, into quoting um, philosophers, but Nietzsche said, if you know the why, you can live anyhow. 
And what he meant by that is if you are in touch with your purpose or finding your true north, and the background image here is the North Star. And the wonderful thing about the North Star is as the world turns, the North Star stays um, oriented. As a matter of fact, you can just look at the stars around it back to our um, navigating choppy waters. If you have your true north, which is really for most corporations is that investment of time in terms of re solidifying your mission, vision, values, um, really getting a sense for whom do you serve, tapping back into that idea of what gets you out of bed in the morning. And then very importantly, I just wanna talk about this for a second, is identifying your personality. And right now, we live in a very sensitive landscape. Say the wrong thing, you're kind of cooked, right? And personality is something that is long-term and when a brand figures out its personality, it helps it to endure. And I'll give you an example. Jerry Seinfeld, his personality is funny. Tone, Jerry Seinfeld is funny always, no matter what. If Jerry Seinfeld is doing stand-up, he is a certain type of funny. If Jerry Seinfeld is at a funeral, he is a different type of funny. But I'm going to place a bet that Jerry Seinfeld is still lighthearted, even in serious times. So an encouragement here is to really figure out your personality and it'll help you to figure out how to act in these trying times. Next slide, please. Next strategy, listen. And I think this is something, listen and, and also just talk to consumers, but I just wanted to point out some of these tools that are available out there. Um, on the paid tools side, depending on what your budget is, there are wonderful tools like NetBase and Adobe. This top graph here shows one of the dashboards from this, and these dashboards will tell you the volume of conversation around a certain topic, but also the sentiment, the attitudes, the emotion around a certain topic. Um, but there's a lot of free resources out there as well on any of the social media platforms, Google, Instagram. Um, you can do hashtag and keyword searches. Um, within Google Trends, they have, a, if you go to trends.google.com, um, you can look at what is trending in terms of current searches, which is really like the crystal ball into what consumers are thinking at any given time. Twitter also has a trending now page. The, the image on the bottom right, what you can see here is that a very popular trending search, meaning that it rose in popularity, was, was the question around antebellum meaning, meaning. And this was around the time that a band called Lady Antebellum renamed their band to Lady A. And what it tells us is that consumers, people, right, are interested in understanding the political and historical context of the things that are going on today. Next slide, please. Um, so into the third strategy, which is just to act authentically. And this is a very recent example. So on TikTok, which is a platform that's growing in popularity, this guy, Baby Mara Mara X Kitten, um, in his profound boredom at home, decided to take his almond for a walk. So he flipped his almond into the dog leash and then took it for a, a walk. And he recorded a really charming song. Now, what happened was, is that on TikTok, these things go viral and other people started doing the same. California Almonds heard um, by listening to the conversation, California Almonds is, is a historically fun-loving brand. So what they did is they offered a friendly respite in, in the, all the chaos that's happening right now. And that any content that was posted um, with the hashtag Almond Walk, which was 996 videos, um, California Almonds branding was, uh, was right there to catch people. And I had read that they got a billion impressions from this very simple act of listening and appropriate personality. Second, um, if you've watched any television, which I have certainly watched more, um, you probably saw this Campbell's Soup ad. Um, and in the background of this ad was a 70s sitcom song, Thank You For Being A Friend. And it dipped a grilled cheese sandwich in some tomato soup. And I'll tell you, there is nothing more comforting, comforting than 70s sitcom grilled cheese and soup. Um, and they, they added extra media to this. Now, granted, they were really well-timed. Canned food did really well during this period, but Campbell's Soup enjoyed a 35% increase in sales as a result of supporting their brand. Last example, 
or point that I want to make around acting authentically is first of all, don't exploit. Right now, there's a lot of insecurity, uncertainty, there's a lot of VUCA out there. And has some brands, Pepsi, Gillette, um, to name a few, have acted inappropriately, inauthentically. Um, so first of all, don't do that. Second of all, um, as you can see by the title of this video, every COVID-19 commercial is exactly the same. We're gonna play about 15 seconds of it just to give you a flavor. It's almost as if they called each other and said, hey, how can we all do the exact same thing? Um, what happened was is that um, they didn't tap into their original purpose, original values, and they got drowned out. So this, this formula for strong face, somber piano music, empty cities um, was essentially just a waste of money for many brands. Um, so those are some of my musings on um, how to find balance in this time. I'm gonna turn it over to Eric Johnson. He's gonna talk about um, the need to get back to basics and also some tips for listening. Eric, to you. Thanks, man. So, um, Andy, go ahead. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the, the tenor I've been hearing from clients, um, large and small, that um, we've, over the last decade, we've seen a focus has shifted from creative excellence and Super Bowl spots and winning awards and all the things that the advertising is known for. And there's been a big shift over into data and all the wonders that AI can do. But what I'm hearing from a lot of the clients that we're talking with and, and other people who run agencies is, now's the time to get rid of a lot of the whiz bang stuff, the gimmicks, and get back to the basics. And it's not the four Ps from marketing from your textbook from 1975. It's kind of the modern basics. You think about it, digital marketing has been around since 1994, effectively. And we need to kind of think about what are the back to basics in this environment. Let's go to the next one. So first of all, kind of what's happened in this last three months. And there's basically winners and losers. So if you happen to be the brand manager at Clorox, this has been the greatest time ever because you didn't have to do a lot and you sold a lot of product. Same with Peloton. Remember, there was a controversy about their spot they ran for Christmas, but like they had the perfect product when all the gyms closed and people are willing to spend $2,400 for a bike plus a monthly fee to exercise. Similarly, Zoom. All of a sudden, we all had to be on these platforms and they have made it rain. Amazon, I think, had to hire 15,000 people just to keep up with demand. And then delivery services have cleaned up. Grubhub and DoorDash have gone up tremendously in value and have scaled their business as people didn't want to go out um, and restaurants were closed. And there, so there's, a bunch, there's not that many winners out of all of this. And then there was Corona, which in, in class this semester, we were kind of joking around because when it first happened, it was called coronavirus and they thought, oh my gosh, how unfortunate for Corona. Corona took advantage of that in some cases and bars were offering two for one Coronas at the beginning of the crisis until the bars all had to close. They, I think, are going to probably do fine in this. But over on the right-hand side, there's been a lot of firms that have unfortunately been, been cratered where their business fell off the map for no fault of their own. It's just that the biz, this corona caused people to be anxious about whether I'm going to get in an Uber. The, my gym closed. I don't want to fly on an airplane because I'm worried about it. I can't go to my Olive Garden. I'm not going to stay at Marriott Hotels. And heaven forbid, I worked on Princess a few years ago. If you remember, there was a boat stuck out at sea and the, and the, the government wouldn't even let it land in San Francisco. And then they were to spread the people from that ship across the country. It's a terribly difficult thing as a marketer. So these brands have some rebuilding to do and some bouncing back. And it's gonna be very challenging in the coming months to recover quickly because they happen to just be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And then I'll tell you personally, you know, I run an agency, I've been doing it for 20 years. The marketing business has been beat up as clients pulled back their dollars and they basically said, whatever we're gonna do, we're gonna do it with less money 
And by the way, we want you to work harder at it. So it's been a really interesting time. And then similarly, we have a co-working business. We're involved in one here in El Segundo. We have four other locations we're partnered in. And overall, co-working has gotten beat up because people are worried about going to offices. And for the most part, they were short-term deals, meaning you could get out within 30 or 60 days. And people just stopped coming to the office and said, I'm not going to pay anymore. And that whole category is, is really being readjusted to based on, on the realities of, of government saying it's not safe to go back to the office. We're hoping that that's going to melt in the coming weeks and months, but it's really cratered that business. So it's, it's a time where for no fault of your own, if you're in the wrong sector, the wrong kind of company, you could get beat up and you're fortunate if you're on the right side of it. So that's what. So, so kind of the back to basics metaphor we think is, there are, we view it as there are kind of three R's of marketing. There's the relevancy, resilience, and respect that you need to play back to people to, to adjust to the new times. Go to the next one. So relevancy. So you can see here's a Mint Mobile commercial where someone's putting fingers in someone's mouth. Anything where a lot of people are close, not so good anymore. We finished a commercial for um, an anti-fraud campaign for the Security and Exchange Commission in mid-February, just before everything shut down. And it was a, a shot in a restaurant in downtown LA and we weren't able to air it until just now because restaurants weren't open and it looked insensitive. So we've kind of framed it as there were things that you would say before COVID and after COVID. It's kind of before and after. And what's interesting is that I've been in many meetings where people say, was this made back in January, February, last quarter, because that's not appropriate now. And so as you're going forward, making sure your work is relevant. And then, then you gotta be able to react nimbly and quickly to what's going on in the environment and make sure your brand doesn't sound tone deaf. An example of somebody doing a great job is Ben and Jerry's, um, a company that's been known for being very progressive in their views, um, came out and basically said, we must dismantle white supremacy. We're very bold. And the company had been bought many years ago by Unilever, but clearly the Unilever leadership let them do what they want. And they came out with one of the boldest, most confident statements that resonate with lots of people and probably helped them sell more ice cream. So being relevant and sensitive to the times, whether it's COVID or, or, or all of the uh, civil unrest is important. Then being resilient, which is not necessarily, as Matt was showing you, um, a bunch of sad piano music videos. I just don't think that motivated anyone to buy anything. But being sensitive to what's going on and saying, listen, we're here, we're here for you, and we're going to send you a signal of positivity in light of this. So Headspace has gone out and had some really kind of happy ads that just been ro uh, rotating recently saying, we're here from you. And if you haven't used it, it's an app and you can basically do meditation. And they did it in a very positive kind of, hey, if you do this, you're going to feel better. And you cannot go out and look desperate. You've got to demonstrate some utility or value. A number of brands like McDonald's actually, for the first time, separated the, the golden arches to show we've got to be distanced. So it was a really clever little device to show we're sensitive. And they also poured it on saying, we've got de uh, delivery and they've been cranking it out through their uh, through drive throughs And businesses that have been drive throughs have done very, very well. And you may have seen recently, Starbucks announced they're shifting their whole business model, closing 400 stores and shifting it more towards pickup and drive through So that's showing resiliency in the face of this, this onslaught. And, these companies are thinking this is probably going to be a long-term shift in behavior, not just something that happens for three months. And then the third piece is around respecting the consumer. Um, for those of you like Matt and I that have been watching a lot of TV, what you may be noticing is a lot of poorly produced spots that are kind of hitting you the wrong way, even during prime time when you wouldn't expect it. You'd normally see beautiful car and beer commercials. And now it's crepey skin or trial attorneys getting you to call them after you have an accident. Oftentimes kind of badly produced and kind of just, you don't want to watch TV anymore because it's just so annoying. And so at the same time, people are saying, wait a minute, you know what? There's all this, Netflix um, has been booming. Disney came out with their streaming service, HBO has a new one. Hey, this is really good. I'm willing to pay five, 10, $16 for that experience. And now marketing has got to step it back up and these brands got to go and show respect for people. Otherwise, there's going to continue to be a shift away from commercial supported advertising or content into these streaming services. 
And if you're going to go out and run it, make sure it's done thoughtfully. So Nike famously did a really beautiful spot for the first time saying, don't just do it, say, don't do it around racism. Go to the next one. So what do you need to do? And I, I've framed this in terms of if you're a, a small or medium sized business, what are some tactical things you might want to do if you happen to be in the LA area? Well, if you have a business that's had restricted retail operations, let's say you're a restaurant, you can only have half your seats filled. Well, first of all, let people know you're open for business. There's a lot of businesses still closed. Elevate your awareness. And as Matt was saying, I think digital is one of the best ways to do it because you can geo-target it. You can do it instantly and you can turn it on or off as you see effectiveness. Next one. Um, there's a perception that um, we're not, nobody's gonna go buy anything because there's high unemployment and demand is gonna be down. Well, listen, be sensitive to that and offer people deals. Um, many people after 9-11 said no one's gonna get back on planes, but when they offered really low deals, people got back on planes. And so right now you're starting to see some very aggressive uh, offers on cars, on food, lots of other things that people haven't been able to do at, at, at sit down restaurants and bars. And these things can go, get you back in the habit of going out. The next one. There's still concern about catching COVID and we're seeing them spikes around the country. We found, and we happen to have uh, locations where you physically have to come in, overdo your message about cleanliness and safety. We got these big blue stickers all over on the floor saying, here's where you go and get your touchless sanitizer on your hand. Please stay six feet away. Do that almost to, to overkill because it sends a signal, we care about this, odds are we're gonna care about this in everything we do. Go to the next one. And then make sure again, that your work is updated and, and appropriate for the time. It's sensitive, as Matt was saying, to what people are feeling right now and make sure you, you're not putting anything out there that's gonna possibly offend. In fact, we've had a number of our clients ask us to go through all the things you're putting out on the internet and eliminate anything that could possibly be perceived as insensitive because it's worse than running nothing. And so be thoughtful about it. Go to the next one. And then again, a lot of paid advertising can be perceived as annoying, especially if it's poorly crafted. Make sure you refine it and make Make sure you're respectful for consumers. You're taking their time away from the show they wanted to watch. Make sure it's inviting them in to buy the product or consider purchasing your product. Uh, I gave this example over on the side here um, where, where um, you had Oreos and they say, stay home, stay playful. Well, that's okay. They have license to do that. They're a cookie. And it's, it's, it's appropriate for what they, they're offering. Go next one. And then I'll end with just some opportunities well there's a lot of, of angst about um, you know agencies having less money to spend clients pulling back there are clearly some things that have benefited and there have heavily been in sectors that have been regulated that we're going to go through a digital transformation but the COVID accelerated all of that so for instance healthcare, we've been focusing a lot on first responders and what a great job they have done but one of the things that has risen is this distance healthcare has become important if you wanted to go and get um, tested, oftentimes these, uh, these locations are now doing distance healthcare and basically asking you a bunch of questions before you're even allowed to go in. And doctors are providing distance healthcare where they, they don't want or can't go in to see patients all over the country. And they're now using this um, technology to make it much easier to provide. And we see that growing um, as, as people come back into healthcare and elective things are happening more frequently than just the emergencies. Government, obviously, with the PPP loans and all of the overall spending you're seeing is going to continue to grow, whether you like it or not. And that impact, impacts the whole economy. We happen to have in our agency um, a number of federal government clients, and they kept spending, and we're seeing new RFPs come out for fairly large contracts. And so if you're in the marketing business, there'll be a lot more spending in, in the government sector. And lastly, education. There's been a lot of anxiety about what's going to happen. Are students going to come back? We see this as an opportunity that if you can differentiate why you're a great institution and your brand story is right and you're going to have a great offering coming in in the fall, and it's probably going to be a, a hybrid model in most cases, we think that many universities will actually be able to survive this and, and thrive as, as school comes back in session in the fall. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Matt.
Uh, so Matt talked about the need to find balance and Eric about the, the need to get back to basics and the three R's. I'll present some ways that businesses can be part of the solution through four different market creation strategies. But first, it's important to note that we believe that digital adoption will intensify um, in the short term and the long term as well. Uh, whether it's food delivery, order and pay by phone, and as Eric mentioned, education. Second, these behavioral changes will exist most likely long after COVID-19. And then third, for some everyday activities such as getting your hair cut or going to the gym, consumers may wait for significant milestones like a vaccine. So to be proactive, we believe that businesses should consider four different market creation strategies as shown in this matrix with two dimensions. Uh, the first dimension, the y-axis, around existing or new markets and the second dimension around the x-axis, existing products or new products. So here are some examples of each. For product development, meaning new products and existing markets, a local Los Angeles apparel brand named Christy Dawn shifted some of its manufacturing from its dresses to using the same fabrics and materials to produce face masks. So some brands such as Christy Dawn can look to create new products or packaging that help address the challenges brought on, brought on by COVID-19. Second, diversification is a market creation strategy where businesses can create new products for new markets. Uh, this is one example is what Honeywell is doing for airline safety. They've created airline safety packs, packs of masks, uh, including masks, wipes, and gloves um, rather than the standard peanuts and pretzels. So again, diversification strategy is where you'll create new products, um, typically unrelated to your existing business that allow you to enter new markets. The third strategy is called market development. And this is where um, brands such as our, one of our favorite restaurants in the South Bay, Fish Bar, um, pivots from its core competency, which was sit down dining, to becoming a more of a general store, supplying household goods uh, such as milk, cheese, paper towels, toilet paper, in addition to its core competency, uh, fish. And so again, Fish Bar attempted to be part of the solution by increasing its offering um, and bringing in perhaps new people uh, that may not have gone to the restaurant. And then the fourth and final strategy in a market penetra is a market penetration strategy, and this is where businesses can supply or simply seek to gain more customers. Um, for instance, Camps is an independent gym, boutique gym based out of Madison, Wisconsin in Miami, Florida. And what Camps did was it took its boot camp work at workouts online with highly well-produced live Zoom sessions. And they also produced a Camps on Demand offering, which allowed people to, for a small uh, amount per month, to be able to access pre-taped pre sessions for their workouts. And a typical camps class uh, might have 300, 400 people zooming in from literally around the world. So by following this market penetration strategy, this small independent gym out of Wisconsin and Florida was able to um, sustain some revenue and stay in business. So to wrap up, uh, we believe that businesses need to, number one, balance their short-term performance with long-term brand building measures, as, uh, as Matt mentioned. Uh, we believe that brands and companies need to be authentic. Number three, we believe that businesses need to reinvent and transform their business where necessary. And number four, to deploy a market creation strategy where they feel it's relevant. So we, you know, we feel short-term and long-term um, businesses by being proactive um, can sustain revenues, can fill in revenues with new businesses. And we believe um, like other things, this too, this storm too will pass. Um, so we have some time for Q and A. Nola, do you want to? Um, sure, of course. Call Thank in some questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And. Um, 
I am going to address the questions in the Q&A um, first, but I also saw that Kathy, you've had your hand up for quite a while. So I definitely um, want to get to you first since you have your hand raised, um, Kathy. And then um, I'll get to um, next question on the Q&A. So Kathy, I am going to allow you to talk. So you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, Kathy, uh, are you able to unmute? Okay, so we'll get back to you, Kathy, and let me get to the other questions. Um, Nick had a question. During recessions, companies like Netflix, Airbnb, Uber, Venmo, et cetera, were born and created. What companies do each of you have your eye on now that could potentially make the biggest impact, brand or marketing, and be the potential success story post-COVID? Great question. Yeah. Eric, do you want to take a stab I'll, at that one? I'll, I'll jump in. A, a couple of things. Uh, and this is kind of being a good observer of human behavior, I, I think. So people have been eating a lot, and they, I think, kind of like the, the freshman 15, they're going to have the COVID-19. And we're seeing there's going to be an opportunity to get focused on being healthy again. And people are going to start going slowly back to the gym. But there's a bunch of interesting companies that are doing plant-based foods. So we think companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible will continue to do really well, especially as meat prices gone higher. But then there's a whole slew of other products that are kind of in the better for you food category as people try to go get healthy again after um, eating uh, Matt's uh, grilled cheese sandwich and frozen pizza, which was selling out for about two months. And then we also see there's gonna be some follow-on businesses. So for instance, I happen to be involved in the, in the co-working business and I'm not sure WeWork is gonna stay out of bankruptcy, but we think that when you get around to the fall, people who are having their leases come up are gonna probably wanna step back into the pool lightly and won't wanna go back and drive 45 minutes to work and will likely come back into more flexible office spaces, be they executive suites or co-working or some other model in between. So we think things will evolve and I think some of the businesses that might have fallen a little bit will actually come back stronger after people adapt their behavior. I'll also add that I, I, I wonder if in the education sector if one area for opportunity will be firms, third party firms and vendors that help higher education as well as secondary schools do a better job at producing high quality video content. Um, as we again migrate to online, uh, video is one primary modality for delivering content. So that may be uh, a new, not a new sector of industry, but maybe there will be a, a renewed emphasis on, on that. Um, I'll, I'll chime on that. I think uh, a couple spaces that I'm watching and participating in is one is VR uh, with Facebook's acquisition of Oculus and then the Oculus Quest, which is a somewhat affordable, depending on, um, on where you're at with the income, um, headset that has almost no setup. It's very user friendly and it does two things. One is it transports you to other places. Um, I think right now there's a lot of people who just want to be elsewhere. But two is that it connects people in different places together in a way that no other technology can. And whoever can crack the code um, on how to bring people together in a virtual space in a really easy way where you get expressions and expressions and gestures and body position and things like that, um, I think will be a winner. Um, also, uh, drone delivery. Drone delivery is a category that is growing exponentially. Granted, it's still pretty nascent, but it's, it is going to be here. And I think one of the things that COVID did is it removed a lot of the barriers like telemedicine that there was a lot of things that stood in the way between these new technologies and consumers with um, you know, policy and things like that. And I think that COVID removed a lot of these barriers and it's given uh, some of these new technologies a chance to grow much more quickly. Great, thank you guys. Um, Michael has a question. Given the immense growth of employees working from home, 
Do you anticipate this trend will continue to grow after the pandemic? If so, how would you advise advertisers to adjust their strategies? I'll give it a shot. Do you want to jump in? Or Matt? Go, Eric. Uh, well, here's here's the what I I have um, I'm, I'm living this right now because I have a 50,000 square foot space I'm sitting in. What I'm seeing happening is is that people start are starting to come back to work, especially if they're willing to go to a restaurant, they're probably willing to come back to work. But what you're finding is it's uneven. If you have childcare issues and there's no summer camp or no school, you're probably not going to come back. And I, what I'm seeing is most employers are letting people have the choice. And that that flexibility has never been available before, and that we're going to see a mix. There's going to be some people that won't come back to work at all, and some people that relish the socialization and the ideation that comes from brainstorming in the room. And for for brands, it becomes an interesting issue, which I think will benefit digital platforms because if you're working from home, you have you're basically on your laptop all the time, and you're looking at content online and you're more likely to be using search you're more likely to be um, consuming information on these video platforms and they will ultimately probably have advertising supporting them so the for the home the home worker which i i think will probably still be at 25 percent home worker even as we go through the fall you'll have to find ways to reach them in interesting ways for the people coming back to work it'll be returning back to normal and we'll be seeing more spend on radio ads and billboards as people are driving as you've done in the past. Um, I'll add that, you know, I think one thing happened was that it just worked a lot better than people thought it would, is that work got done. It was technologies like Zoom made it much more, made it really easy to meet. And in many cases, I think people felt closer and more personal. You know, one of the things about a, let's say, for example, teaching in a classroom is you've got a first row, second row, third row, fourth row, so on zoom everyone's in the first row um and so you have instant you have access to everyone's feelings and faces um the other thing that i think remote work has done is it solved some business challenges you know facebook i think twitter announced um that you can work remotely almost indefinitely but what it does is it allows them to pay market value it's very expensive to live in los angeles it's very expensive to live in new york and if you're going to work in the local hq um, you have to pay accordingly in order to attract the right talent. What this has done is that it's freed up businesses to hire talent who can live in less expensive markets. So I think it's going to stay. Okay. I think you're muted. I can't hear you. All right. Um, Matt, did you want to answer the question or I can move on to the next one? Yeah, the next question is fine. Sure. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, address those who have raised their hands. So, Francisco, I do see that your hand is up. I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk. So, um, I go ahead and un unmute and please ask your questions to the panelists. Oh, hi. Thank you for um, conducting this great presentation. Uh, I have a couple of related questions. First, I'd like to uh, ask a question of Eric. Have you seen, Eric, a change in the spending towards the multicultural markets more, especially uh, Hispanic, Asian, and African-American as a result of uh, COVID-19 and the current situation, or has remained the same? And the second question is for the three of you. Do you believe that this um, COVID-19 is going to open the doors for the uh, CEOs or C-level executives to see more clearly the opportunities or to try to leverage the opportunities that the multicultural markets offer to them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll take the, the first one. Spending just overall um, stalled out, and I don't think it was necessarily because of multicultural or not, just people wanted to retain their cash. And for the most part, cut back their spending unless they happen to be in a couple sectors like, like my Clorox example or grocery stores. They basically, people were fearful and now they're just starting to come out from under a rock and say, all right, now I'm willing to spend. And I think we don't know what the impact will be on different kinds of marketing yet. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I, Andy, would you like to go? Um, I was going to um, offer thoughts on the second question, but go ahead, Matt. Um, I actually forgot what I was going <laughs> to say. I, I, I extinguished it from my mind the minute I knew I wasn't going. So, um, I think I understood number two, which was, um, will COVID-19 open doors for CEOs or other C-level executives to look for new opportunities? And I think, if anything, this experience has taught all of us no longer to be complacent. I mean, Eric mentioned Clorox, and Clorox is his business its business has boomed um, just by nature of what product it, it produ has produced for, for decades. But for most companies, I think this has taught us all to be very, uh, a lot more uh, quicker, agile, more nimble, and to look for new opportunities. I mean, that's what we're doing in education. And I would imagine that um, businesses across any industry are looking, looking to that. Um, so I think at a high level, it's taught us that if, you know, if, we, if we're not proactive, and if we just kind of like remain uh, true to what we've done well in the past, then that may, may not work well in the future. Um, I'll add something that I think for a, a long time and in many cases this is still true. It's sort of like you put an ethnically ambiguous person in your communications and it feels like a box has been checked. Uh, this person could be from any um, background and so it feels like you're being culturally sensitive. I think what's happened, especially with the recent protests and Black Lives Matter, is it's really ripped the, the Band-Aid off in terms of showing um, real inequities in culture, but also really celebrating what these different cultures are. And I think that the, the businesses and the brands and the agencies that are going to succeed are going to be the ones that have the most diverse teams, that the people whom their products and marketing are representing are the ones who are creating that work. Um, and so I think it's, it's not just a um, let's hope, I think it is going to be an imperative. It's gonna be required. Thank you guys. Um, I'm sorry, did you, someone else have something to add? I'll keep going. Okay, great. Um, Andrew, I do see that your hand is up. So I'm gonna go ahead and allow you to talk. So please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Andrew? Well, first off, hi, Nola. I know uh, we've, we've chatted, we had a meeting before. Um, uh, I just want to say this is a great presentation. I really um, enjoyed it. I, I've been graduated for a year, so it's been a while since I've heard from, uh, you know, professors talk. So it's really, really good to hear that. Um, I graduated from UC Riverside, and I'm currently working for a startup company based in Riverside. We're a tech company that uses Bluetooth and NFC to essentially connect people with uh, people you pass with, cross paths with, uh, or even things you cross paths with, essentially diving into the IoT world. My question is, um, obviously networking is gonna be extremely different post COVID. People are gonna be more cognizant of the space between, uh, you know, going to events, the space that you could be between each other or shaking hands even. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to know uh, everyone's opinion on and the fam familiarity is on Bluetooth technology and how that is beginning to roll out in order to connect people with not just users, but other forms of technology um, and also NFC technology, how that's going to play a role in this sort of passive way of networking and even advertising. Hmm. Andrew, great question. Um, that's a little bit above my pay grade. Um, so I'll defer to our other panelists, Eric or Matt. I have, I have a thought that, I, that I'll offer is, um, one is, is I think another category that is going to continue to grow is just contactless everything, um, which is I think what you're, what you're talking about. Um, IoT is growing. I read something recently that, it, that um, this is like the third wave of the digital revolution is now machines talking to other machines. And so we are very much in the, um, in the throes of that right now. I'm reminded, I worked on an automotive brand. Um, I've worked on a, on a few, but this was a time when gas prices went like through the roof. They were five bucks, five plus, 550 a gallon um, in Los Angeles. And what happened also, for, for this particular automotive brand, the people stopped buying SUVs. And what was so remarkable was literally like a week after gas prices went back down, SUV sales went back up. And I say this, that our memories are short. 
Um, I think people, if you go outside, people are hugging. And so I think there's, there's human nature and then there's, and I think we have really short term memories. And so I think it's only a matter of time before people are holding hands and like that photo that uh, Eric showed where people are sticking their fingers in each other's mouth. I, I, I agree with almost everything you said, Matt. I'll just, I'll just comment that I, I have seen that the, the adoption of digital behavior has only accelerated during this time. And I think some of it won't go back. I think people, I have many personal friends who want, they'd never done per grocery shopping online and now they do it. They're like, why would I ever go and walk around a store? And I think that near field and I think um, devices that monitor like um, your keys and who's in what location, once you get used to that, you're like, hey, this is pretty cool. And you get the idea around it. This is kind of force some of those things to, to come into your lives and you quickly adapt to that. And I think that the, the shift, like the dollars that were in digital, for instance, were about 52% of all spending, went up to 75% or so during this period. And I think you're gonna see this kind of continued adoption to digital being the norm. And it doesn't mean people aren't gonna hug. I think they will, they'll be high-fiving again at some point, but these technologies will make it easier to do it so it's kind of passively happening and you'll be able to exchange business cards without actually handing over the card. Those, and then those similar monitors in retail will allow the retailer to know when you do go into stores, who you are, what you're interested in, and they can give you specific offers. All of that stuff has been baking for a while and will only accelerate as a result of this. Also, Andrew, I wonder if this will accelerate the use of robots, you know, both at the warehouse level. I read somewhere that Amazon, because of some COVID infection issues with some of its distribution centers, is or is looking at um, amplifying its use of robots. But I just wonder if that will also appear at the retail level. Um, intelligent machines and robots that can service as well as, you know, a human being in a store like CVS. I think it's also hard to talk about this without talking about, as we think about artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, facial recognition, um, connected devices, without talking about privacy. So it's something that's very much also, I think, on people's minds as we think about um, social justice and we think about our rights. Um, is that which businesses and what we just saw last week is a bunch of businesses were like, I'm going to, I'm hitting pause on this whole thing right now um, because it's really complicated. Um, so I think that's going to be another um, element to consider as we continue to be more digital. Actually, thank you guys. Uh, there's a question that ties right into your comment, Matt, um, from Bradley. So his question is uh, for situations like COVID 19, the current civil unrest, most brands feel the need to step forward and take a stance. Do you guys have any tips on how marketers adapt brand strategies and put forward relatable, mes relatable messaging without coming off as being a quote, try hard mm -hmm. brand or forcing contrived messaging? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Matt and Eric, why don't I um, start first? And I would say that, man, you, really need to look at your past history and whether this is a truly authentic and genuine stance or it's a stance just to kind of address the, the current situation um, in, a, in a disingenuine type approach. So I think brands need to look at who they are, as Matt mentioned, um, who they, who they, what they stand for, who they are. And if you are, you know, if you have a history of, for instance, lack of diversity in your employment ranks, um, then you need to, you know, maybe fix the issues before you um, begin communicating uh, at a superficial level any kind of stance. I'll add to that. Sorry, Eric, I saw your mouth no, moving. Um, you know, I'd say be, be about it, don't talk about it. Um, and, a, and a lot of that has to do with the makeup of your organization. Um, if you are Caucasian owned, um, your messaging would look and sound different than if you are African American owned or uh, Latinx owned um, or operated or depending on, on what the makeup of your organization looks like. Um, I had another point that I blanked on. It was so good. Eric, I'll interrupt you <laughs> if it comes to me. Well, I'll, 
I'll jump in and add to, to Andy's note about authenticity. So at, at, our, at our business, people said, well, we got to do something. There's, there's, there was this pressure to go do something. I said, well, guys, how about we do something that we had already been involved in? So we were involved in a, in a nonprofit that's dealing with homelessness and, and racial inequity has caused a lot of the issues of why we have 65,000 homeless people in, in LA and we got to do something about it. So we said, why don't we just redouble our efforts to help that which is doing something tangible rather than writing a check or giving somebody an afternoon off, which to me is kind of not doing justice to what's really going on. So, so make a, something meaningful and get people actually doing something tangible, I think is, is, is the answer so that it, it, it feels real. I'd say the other thing is I've seen in this industry that we marketing has not been a terribly diverse uh, business and the, the good news is the brands are now coming and saying we will not hire you unless the team working on this looks like our customer base looks like America and we're seeing that that pressure is, is actually having some impact we just got to make sure we have a nice pipeline of talented people of, of diverse backgrounds to come in and be involved in this business I, I remembered my point Eric you jogged my memory um, unlike Gillette that during the uh, me too era um, Gillette did a you know a, a rally cry for come on guys it's time to to man up and it got panned by the internet as being um, you know insincere and inauthentic um, two things come to mind one is that Dove men care Dove is a very Dove is a brand that knows who it is and whom it's for and what it's all about and Dove men what they did is they created a uh, fund for guys paternity leave that they had identified that one of the issues um, in the pay in the pay gap between men and women was around um, paternity and maternity leave and so they created a fund they didn't necessarily advertise it I think it went into a press release but people talk about it so it used the PR engine um, in a very different way mm -hmm. um, also P&G just launched some work around um, the what's happening in the, in the current context around protests, but it's the third year that they've done it. And so they've been on the right side of history um, for several years, um, which gives them a lot more credibility to come in um, and offer solutions, but also to, to empathize with people. I also wanted to give a quick shout out to our last questioner, Bradley. I think it's the Bradley who is one of our M School alums. So Bradley, hello from Zoom land, we miss you. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, maybe we have time for just one more question, and I apologize that we're not able to get through all of the questions, but I think this one is quite relevant since we're seeing all the un unemployment numbers out there. How do you think brands and companies will respond in terms of hiring and recruiting, such as types of jobs um, that are offered or what they will be looking for? And I'm assuming that this relates more to the marketing space. Thoughts on that? Professor Johnson, would you like to take the lead on this one? Well, I, I'm not exactly clear on the question, but I think what we're going to see is, is like, for the most part, people have done layoffs and furloughs, and unless they had a very solid business, that's generally been the, the, the tenor. As people start to bring folks back, my guess is there's going to be a lot more scrutiny about who you're hiring and making sure it again looks like America. And I think there's gonna be tremendous visibility. And I think that's one of the positive things about all of this, this conversation and that's, that's good. But the challenge will be, it still comes down to like, you gotta have the business and the revenue to do that. And I think we're unfortunately in for some continued um, difficulties economically. And it's nice to see the stock price up a little bit um, today, but I think we're gonna to continue to see relatively high unemployment as we move into the fall and there will not be as many people rehired as, as unfortunately there should be. Mm -hmm. Eric, I'm also reminded of the pendulum conversation around in-house capabilities versus hiring out capabilities, which I think might relate, might tie into this question. We'll talk yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so there's been a big discussion as brands, like I, I ran marketing at a company called Activision, the video game space, and we built a big in-house capability. And at one point it got so large, we said, you know what, we can variableize this and we'll give it back out to, to ad agencies. And I think we're seeing a bunch of large companies do the same thing. And then they go, wait a minute, all this overhead with benefits and we're not getting the freshest ideas. And there, there's gonna be a shift back towards 
using agencies or freelancers to go complement that to bring fresh ideas to bear. And that's, that's gonna continue to be a, 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 a trend that will go both sides. We're gonna hire more in-house because it's faster, cheaper, and then they realize it isn't so much and they'll shift it back out as they need more thinking. Eric also makes a really good point about the mix of your employee base. And I'd also add that I'm just wondering as measurement and returns on business investment become more and more important um, given the economic situation that maybe disciplines like analytics, uh, data, data science, and the ability to kind of measure the effectiveness of marketing spending will come, not come to the forefront because these are at the forefront, but even become stronger, more strongly entrenched uh, at the forefront of employment opportunities. Uh, and uh, Andy, I'll just add one last thing to that. Yes, there's, there's gonna continue to be lots of jobs. Being a data scientist is one of the most in-demand jobs in the world to be able to provide that. But I'll tell you, I've also seen a realization that, hey, we need big ideas that move people and create an emotional connection. And I think that there's a counterbalance to that, which is we can't just be counting the numbers. And there are, there are many cases where a company may be amazing in analytics, but they just miss the story and people don't love their brand. And I see there's gonna be actually a shift as we go into the back half of the year to make sure we got a great story about why you should fly on our airline or get on our cruise line or go to our restaurant. And that will be creativity. It won't be data that's going to accomplish that. Good point. Great. So that is all the time that we have. I'd like to thank everyone for joining who joined us today. And as I mentioned, this webinar will be available as well. And please feel free to join us in our next webinar, um, which will be around inclusive leadership strategies to keep employees engaged. So for those of you who are managers, please join us on Thursday. Thanks so much for joining and have a great day.